Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, catching up with the Orange of Syracuse, uh, just uh, culminating with their uh, spring drills with the spring game on April 14th. We bring in John Casillo from SB Nation's Noons Magician to help us uh, sort through the personnel. John, all right. Uh, glad to have you on. As course, always, uh, when we think Syracuse football under Dino Babers, we think offense and uh, to, to run that offense. We don't necessarily think protection. We think quarterback play and wide receivers that can make things happen in space. But let's start with the offensive line because it's very important what they're able to do. And I know uh, since the Babers regime took over, we've talked a number of times about the offensive line not being able, uh, not being at the point that they could allow the the skilled players to to do their thing. But uh, maybe that's uh, changing. Yeah, I mean, in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of injuries on the offensive line, but. Um, what, what that's actually yielded is now a pretty deep group um, of guys all the way around. I think uh, they said the other day in a Syracuse.com article, I think this is our most experienced group in almost 30 years um, in terms of returning starts, having five guys who've all started full seasons coming back. Um, it seems like last year, like we had an experiment with Aaron Cervais um, playing center. That's probably going to move. Um, and Sam Heckel's going to take that position. Um, in general, we have everybody back. Um, Aaron Roberts missed all of last year, but he's arguably our best offensive lineman. Um, him and Cody Conway are kind of going to hold things down um, on the left side. And then you'll have Heckel. Um, Cervais is going to switch over to right tackle. And then Evan Adams is going to uh, man the right guard spot. So uh, these are all guys who've played at least a full season, um, starting if not more. That should really help us out. And you saw a little bit of it at the end of last year when that group started to gel together. Um, despite the fact that Eric Dungy was injured, we were still able to and get much better protection as the year went on. And uh, the hope from everybody is that that kind of translates into, uh, into something better, I guess, from the, uh, from the start of this season. I guess the, John, this next question uh, applies to not only the offensive line, but the entire team uh, difficult to tell during these spring games, uh, which are basically just the fourth or fifth scrimmage, for any particular team, we make a big deal out of it because we can either watch it on TV, watch it uh, streaming live. People are in the stands, but uh, it's uh, to the coaches by and large, it's not any more important than a number of scrimmages out there. And it's not played a a in a way that it was 10 or 15 years ago where it seemed like it was an actual scrimmage. It was a game. Uh, uh, they played by game rules. There was tackling. There was hitting. Uh, the, the teams usually back off on that, at least for large portions of the game. So it's kind of difficult to tell, um, except for a quarterback throwing the ball and receivers catching and uh, defensive backs covering in terms of the physicality, who has uh, the edge. But uh, was there anything as we take you through offensive line and we'll hit the other personnel groups that that really stood out to you? Did it seem legitimate that you could tell um, maybe who had the advantage on the field? Uh, not necessarily. We basically just did an uh, offense versus defense and, you know, kind of switch between the first team and second team. Uh, Eric Dungy didn't play. He's still kind of recovering from an ankle injury. He played most of spring practice, but sat this one out. And admittedly, like we really didn't need to see much of him. Um, Tommy DeVito looked good. I know uh, that name might be familiar to well, some outside of Syracuse fans, but definitely all Syracuse fans. Um, he's our redshirt freshman. He was a four star last year. Um, and he seemed to look, you know, Crisp, I, I'd say he wasn't like 100% on, but he he definitely looked the part and he's going to fit more into, you know, what Dino Babers is looking for in, in a pocket passer in the system. Uh, the one guy who probably looked the best at quarterback was Chance Amy, however. Um, he's uh, our most recent uh, recruit this year. He's from Texas. He's more of a dual threat, um, really fast kid. Um, he's going to add some weight. He's going to probably going to redshirt this year. So uh, we'll see what he develops into, but people seem to really like what he brought and the speed he brought to the table right away. We've got John Casillo on the line from Noon's Magician. You can join him right there on SB Nation for the very best in Syracuse sports coverage. Of course, the spring game on April 14th with a host of teams going to uh, their final session of the spring here in the next a couple weekends. A ton of teams yesterday, a ton of teams coming up this next weekend and uh, trying to get the take on the orange. So the off or we talked offensive line, the wide receivers, obviously a huge part of this offense and a ton of production has moved on. What did you see there? Uh, I think the receivers are going to be a work in progress. I think, you know, Ravian Pierce, our tight end is really going to be um, 
probably somebody we lean a lot more on this year. Last year, uh, he had to get pulled into a lot of blocking duties, and that really diminished what he was able to do in the open field. Um, he's a big target. He's 6'3", 244. Um, so the type of guy that can create some real mismatches between him and then we should, it seems we're moving Jamal Custis um, into an inside receiver role. And Custis is another big kid, 6'5", 228. Um, so between those two guys, both seniors, um, I feel like the passing game is going to look a little bit different this year as we maybe try to exploit some space um, between the defensive line and the linebackers. Um, other than them, Sean Riley and Devin Butler um, are our other most experienced receivers. They they have a chance to really you know shine in this system. I think I don't think we're going to see the type of numbers that guys like Ahmed Atawa put up two years ago, or you know Steve Ishmael and Irv Phillips put up um, recently either. But at the same time, if we have those two guys and maybe some of these freshmen, you know, Nikeem Johnson, Russell Thompson, Bishop, Gerard Johnson, any of those three, uh, be able to kind of jump up and maybe you know catch thirty to forty passes, uh, we could end up seeing a passing game that that doesn't really miss a beat from the last couple of years. Of course, Stephen Butler and Rapion Riley, as you mentioned, uh, key factors last year, not putting up the huge numbers, but secondary targets. Riley, 29 receptions, four touchdowns. Butler, 33 and one touchdown. But Jamal Cust, as you mentioned, he's going to play a prominent role as a senior, eight catches, one touchdown. So this is new for him. There's always the thought that if the guy hasn't hit the field in a prominent way until his senior season, he's probably not quite of the talent caliber as the guys he's replacing, or he would have been a major factor earlier in his career. Any thoughts about that? Well, I think with Custis, he's just had a lot of injury problems. I mean, this is his fifth year on campus. He's really been banged up. Last year, he missed some time with a shoulder injury. But when he was playing, he seemed like he was starting to kind of round into form. I think for him, it's really just going to be a situational thing. Um, I don't think he's going to catch, you know, 50, 60 passes. But if we can get 25 catches out of him and use him in the red zone, like that's to me, that's where he poses a real threat just because of that size advantage. So I hope that we, and I've been pining for this for years. I hope that we employ him in that regard rather than last year, we were trying to, you know, give him some opportunities to go deep and he, while he's fast, he's not fast enough to outrun a lot of ACC uh, defensive backs. All right, John Casillo, Noons Magician, please join him on the SB Nation platform for Syracuse. For your uh, sport of choice, of course, we always talk football here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, turning to the Syracuse defense during uh, not just the spring game, but spring drills. And and obviously you're getting a, giving us a take on where we stand headed toward August. And with the linebackers, a lot to learn, a lot to find out. Uh, I don't know if enough was coming out of spring camp for you to find out too much about who was putting themselves in position to lock down starting spots. But based on the spring game, uh, what are your thoughts about the linebackers? I feel like we didn't get a ton out of the spring game in terms of like where the linebackers stood. However, I think we're pretty locked in on, on who's going to um, play those three starting roles. I think Andrew Armstrong is going to handle the weak side. Keelan Whitner, who's a uh, former safety, is going to handle the strong side. And um, then Ryan Guthrie, who was a Juco transfer last year, um, is going to be the middle linebacker. Uh, I know I discussed on our end, too, on the site. Um, Guthrie was actually a surprising move for middle linebacker, replacing Zaire Franklin, um, you know, who was a three-year captain with SU. Uh, Guthrie was recruited as more of a um, kind of, you know, pass rush, tackle for loss type guy. Um, he, I believe, had led the country in tackles for loss um, his second year at the JUCO level. So... Guthrie doesn't seem to necessarily fit the middle linebacker role the way the Tampa two usually um, utilizes it since that's more going to be coverage. Yes. He's going to cover the run, but um, by and large, like that defense is kind of going to shift on the middle linebacker and his ability to, you know, get back and cover the middle of the field. So it'll be interesting to see how a guy like Guthrie, again, who's more um, kind of a pass rusher, how he's able to, to make that transition. And also, you know, I'm curious to see the, the Keelan Whitner experiment, see, how applying a safety in this role um, works. Whitner is a little, little bit bigger um, on, on the defensive back range size-wise, so plugging him in here shouldn't be too difficult. I think it'll actually help us out in terms of you know something that we were lacking the last couple of years. Uh, we had a lot of linebackers who were geared toward a um, you know chaos and havoc-based system and a lot of pass rushing um, from the linebacker spot, so having somebody who's more of a coverage linebacker like Whitner should be probably more in line with what we need. All right, John, we'll say it at the uh, safety 
spot that you mentioned right there with Antoine Cordy, and, and he seems to have found a home. Yeah, I, I mean, Antoine Cordy is someone who the last two years, he's he's been injured very early. Last year was the first game. The year before it was the second game. Um, but, you know, in his sophomore season, he was probably our best defensive back. So it's going to be great to see him, you know, plug back in at safety. Um, and I, I have high hopes that that the last couple of years of recovery uh, should give him, you know, a really nice place to inhabit here, you know, in, in his redshirt senior season. Um, and hopefully, you know, we start to see some improvement uh, from this secondary, which has kind of struggled the last couple of years. All right, John Casillo, Noons Magician, please join him on his uh, platform right there with SB Nation for Syracuse uh, Sports. Um, of course, uh, football, our priority. And as we head toward August and then September 1st with a date at a Mac school, Syracuse, <laughs> uh, an ACC team going uh, on the road to take on a non-Power 5 as they have three of the four non-conference games against non-Power 5s with a late game uh, in the season against uh, Notre Dame should be interesting. This uh, program intrigues me in regards to what it's capable of doing in a very difficult division with Clemson, Florida State, Louisville, North Carolina State, and even Wake Forest now is good. So it's, it's tough to find any breathing room. Boston College made a bowl game and had a pretty good season. So there there are no lightweights in this division anymore. Yeah, I I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful. I think that Six and six sounds maybe feasible, but it, it, it's going to be a stretch. Have to hope that we get better luck on the uh, injury front that we have in recent years. That'll be the only way we're headed to a bowl game. Yeah, three and five in the conference, lose to Notre Dame, win the other non-conference games. That seems to be the formula right there. All right, John, we appreciate you stopping by, and um, good luck to the Orange. And obviously, from right now until August 1st, we just keep our fingers crossed in terms of injuries and guys not getting in trouble. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> All right, John, take care.